subtract off the off diagonal element, two times three, both equal six, equals zero. Okay, this applies to any problem, matrix of any size. So that means if you have a matrix and it has linearly independent columns or rows, then you know the determinant's going to be zero. If you got a determinant zero, you know the matrix has linearly independent columns or rows. Okay? And as, you've, as we've learned, that has a lot to do with whether we're going to be able to solve the problem, whether the solution is going to be unique. That's why we care. Okay? All right, so finally, if you have a matrix A, it's going to be full rank if and only if the determinant is non-zero. Okay? So if you have a matrix A and its determinant is zero, that means it's not full rank. It doesn't tell you what the rank is, it just tells you it's not n. So if you have a, let's say, a 10 by 10 matrix, you find the determinant at zero, it means the rank of that matrix is 9, 8, 7, 6, or something, but not 10, <coughs> less than 10. If the, if the it's, uh, determinant is non-zero, it means the m matrix is full rank. Okay? So that will end up being pretty convenient for us, as we shall soon see. Okay, so. So, so far, the way we've learned to solve sets of linear algebraic equations is one way, right? Take your set of linear algebraic equations, form this system here, form the augmented matrix, do Gaussian elimination, get a triangular system, back substitute, get the answer, okay? Um, here is another way and introduces an important concept called the inverse of a matrix, okay? So we're only dealing with square matrices at this point, so let's assume the matrix A is n by n matrix, square. Then we're going to call something called the inverse of A, we're going to give that the name A inverse. <laughs> There's a shocker, okay. So A minus 1 means the inverse of the matrix A, okay. So the property of the, matri the inverse of the matrix A is if I multiply on the right hand side by A, Okay, remember how we multiply matrices generally matter. But if I have A and I have the inverse of A, if I multiply A on the right hand side by A inverse or on the left hand side by A inverse, they both give me the same answer. They give me back the identity matrix, right? So this is the, um, this is the matrix equivalent of like, you know, the identity matrix is the, is the matrix equivalent of the scalar number one, right? Like, the identity matrix is just a matrix generalization of what you mean by one, right? It's ones along the diagonal. The inverse, you know, like for example, if someone said, what's the inverse of the number two? You'd say, I don't know, one half, <laughs> right? Because if I multiply them together, I get one back. So, you know, in this context, th that's A, that thing is A inverse, and I is the one you get back, okay? So it's a generalization of how you can multiply and recover, in this case, the identity matrix back, okay? Okay, that's great. So that's the property it has. And um, I'm going to explain to you why it's useful for solving equations in a minute, okay? So let's say that you want to compute A inverse, which you will, okay? So the first thing you want to know is, um, does the inverse exist? I mean, this is the... Just think about everything in life this way. First thing is, does it exist? Next thing is, is it unique, right? Someone loves me. That's existence. Does she love me uniquely? Probably not. It's not okay? Um, all right. Don't quote me. You're not taping this one, are you? <laughs> all right. All right. So we want to know whether this inverse exists and whether this inverse is unique, right? Because in mathematics, if we seek to find something, first thing we want to know is that it exists so we can search for it. But also, it's, it's really a problem if things aren't unique, right? Because things aren't unique, everyone comes up with a different answer. It's not ideal, okay? So it ends up the, the inverse exists if and only if the determinant of that matrix <coughs> A is not equal to zero. So if you have a matrix A, you take the determinant, it is equal to zero, there is no inverse matrix. It does not exist, okay? If the determinant is not zero, then the matrix does invert, exist. And the nice thing is, if it exists, it is unique, okay? So basically, this is an easy thing to check. If you want to find the inverse, the first thing you do is take the determinant of A, okay? If the determinant of A exists, it, it, if the determinant of A is not zero, the inverse exists and it's unique. Okay. All right. So all what I put in this next statement is all these things are equivalent to each other, and I may use them interchangeably. Okay. 
So you see this, this first thing? There's four different things. They all mean the same thing. I might tell you the matrix is singular. Okay? What does that mean? That means the inverse doesn't exist. That's what I mean by singular matrix. It also means the determinant is equal to zero. It also means the rank of the matrix is less than n. Right? So the idea is if, I, if you know the matrix is singular, you automatically know these other three things. Okay? If the, I say the matrix is, no, is non-singular, then I'm telling you the inverse does exist, the determinant is not equal to zero, and the rank of the matrix A is equal to n. Okay? And then I just have some comment. I don't know why I threw this comment in there, but... Um, so if I were to tell you the, the matrix is rank deficient, that means the inverse does not exist because it's not full rank. Okay? All right. So at this point, I've defined what A inverse is, but I haven't told you why it's useful, nor have I taught you how to compute it. Okay? So um, we'll do that soon, but this is just machinery time. Okay? All right. So let's say that you have a two by two matrix. Okay? I'm going to give you an explicit formula on how to calculate the inverse but for a two by two matrix. See, so you have that two by two matrix up there with the components. The inverse of that matrix is equal to, first of all, one over the determinant of A. You can see why the determinant not being zero is important. <laughs> okay. And then how do you find this? Well, first thing I did was I switched the two diagonal elements. Okay. And then um, I negated the two off diagonal elements. Now you might say, that seems really weird. How do you know that's true? I could prove it to you. If I wanted to prove this to you, I would, I would find the determinant of A and plug it in there. It's not hard. It's on the previous slide. And then I would multiply A by inverse and I, would, I could prove to you it's equal to identity matrix. I'll avoid that for now, unless you're <laughs> like totally obsessed with it. Okay. Um, so the, the problem with the inverse is it's hard to compute for anything that's beyond two by two. Okay. Because even though I can give you a formula for the determinant of a three by three matrix, I can't give you a nice clean formula for the inverse of a three by three matrix. Okay. But if you're lucky and the matrix is diagonal, then it's a very simple property. So here's a matrix diagonal matrix. And then if you look up at a inverse, you'll see it's just each diagonal element is one over the corresponding diagonal element of the matrix A. Okay. And that should be pretty easy for you to see that if I multiplied those times each other, rows and columns, I would get ones along the diagonal and zero everywhere else. Okay. All right. Here's a property that's sometimes convenient. Let's say I have a bunch of matrices multiplied together. Okay. And I want to take the inverse of the product of all those matrices multiplied together. That ends up being equal to the following. It's almost easier to, I'm not sure why I insisted on giving an infinite number of matrices there, but so, for example, if I have A times B and I want to take the inverse of the product, implicit in this is A and B can be multiplied together, obviously. Then you switch the order of the matrices and invert them like that. Okay, it works for any A and B that you can multiply. And if you have more than one matrix, you switch them like I showed you in the slide. Okay. And if the dimensions of A and B work out, then the, this, these dimensions will work out too, by definition. Okay, all right. Okay, so we still don't know how to compute this thing for a general problem, right? So, so, I've, uh, so what I've said is the inverse is fun. For us, the first thing. Second thing I've said is if you have a two by two matrix, you can compute it like I told you on the previous slide. Okay, that seems a bit limiting, right? <coughs> because if I gave you only two by two problems, I think you could logically say I'll just do substitution, <laughs> right? If the only thing I can do is solve a two by two problem with your tools, I'm not impressed. All right. So what I'm going to do now is show you how to find the inverse for a matrix of any arbitrary size. It's a bit laborious, but um, you'll get the idea. And this is one of those groups of slides that once I go through the example, you do not want to try to copy down all the stuff if you've seen the slide. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So here's what I aspire to do. So I'm going to form a new augmented matrix here. So I'm going to form a matrix now that looks like the so it's an augmented matrix. The first group of columns are from the matrix A itself. Then I augment that with the identity matrix of the same dimension. Okay. So in other words, if A is a three by three matrix, then I'll have six columns. The first three columns will be A. The th last three columns will be the identity matrix, three by three identity matrix. Okay. 
Oh, I'm going to go through an example in a minute. Now what I have to do is I have to do these elementary row operations and I have to convert this problem here into the problem below. Okay, so if you remember what we did with Gauss elimination, this is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. With Gauss elimination, we took this augmented matrix, right, it looked like A and B, and we transformed that into a new matrix that we called R, and then this thing ended up being F over here, right? So the matrix A became R and the vector B became F. And the idea here was we didn't really know how to solve AX equals B, but we could solve um, RX equal F because R was now a triangular matrix, right? So you're going to do the same thing now, except you're going to form an augmented matrix with A in the identity. And then you have to manipulate this such that when you're done, what used to be A is now the identity matrix, okay? And then what used to be I will be the inverse you're looking for. Okay, I'm not going to prove it, I'm just going to claim it, okay? So you're going to take AI and convert it to A, inver A, and then what's left where I once was will be the inverse matrix you're looking for, okay? How are you going to do it? Row operations, just like we did before, okay? You can't operate on columns because columns aren't equations, only rows are equations. All right, so that sounds all fine in principle. How do you do it? Here's an example, I bet. And, and the equations, get, it gets worse, people. I'm just going to warn you. <laughs> all right. There's nothing like doing things by hand to appreciate MATLAB, right? All right, so here's your problem, okay? You want to find the inverse of this matrix A. It's three by three. At this point, you don't know how to do it because I only taught you how to do a two by two. Obviously, that matrix was two by two. You just use the explicit formula I gave you. But if it's three by three, you've got to do it this way. First thing I do is form the augmented matrix, right? I form the matrix that consists of A, which is the first, see if I can get my pointer going here, the first three columns are A, and then I augment that with the three by three um, identity matrix, okay? What's my goal? My goal is to manipulate this with row operations such that this, these first three columns become the identity matrix, then whatever's left in the final three columns will be the inverse, okay? So my goal is to make this first three columns look like the three by three identity matrix, okay? So first thing I'm gonna do to achieve that is I'm gonna make these two elements zero, right? Because what's the identity matrix? One's along the diagonal. So I need all the off diagonal things to be zero. Remember, it used to be that once I made I could, see it used to, what it, we used to do is make that one zero, that one zero, and that one zero, and then we had a triangular system when we were done. But now we have to make that one zero, 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 and all the diagonals have to be one now. So it's more work. It's roughly twice as much work. All right. So the reason I give you this horrendous um, detail here is so that you can go back and make sure you understand, because it's very hard for me verbally say everything, but again, it's not complex in principle. I want to make that number zero. I'm going to take the first row and multiply it by three and add it to the second row. And that's what you see here. That's where all that came from. That'll make that element zero, okay? You look at wanting to make this zero. How about I take the first row, multiply it by minus one and add it to the third row and that'll make that thing zero. And then you'll get all these corresponding elements and you'll get this. It's just really not exciting for me to explain every element in this matrix. Okay, you can go back and check. But that's, that's what I did. And if you want to go back and check, every single calculation is in there. Okay, so far so good. I've made these things zero. Okay, my, my guess is the next thing I want to do is make that guy zero. And I've, I'm right. I'm right again. All right. So what do I do there? Multiply this row times minus two and add it to this row. That'll make that element right there zero. That's what I did, and that's what you get. Okay, so now I've got an upper triangular matrix, right, for this first three by three system that I want to make the identity matrix. And the next step in the algorithm, even though I'm not presenting a general algorithm, just an example, is to now make all these diagonal elements equal to one. Okay, so it's not hard to make the diagonal elements equal to one. To do this, you multiply the first equation by minus one, right? That'll give you this right here. Multiply the second row by one half. If you multiply the second row by one half, 
you get a 1 there and you get everything else over here. And then what should I do for this row? I guess I better divide everything by minus 5, right? And then I'll get this. It's, it's laborious, okay? So there it is. Now I have an upper triangular matrix. Everything along the diagonal is 1. Now I have to make that one 0, that one 0, and that one 0, okay? So how do I do that? Well, my proposition would be to probably make this one 0 first. Let's see. Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. Oh, yeah. Make these two guys 0, okay? So how do I do that? I'll just make sure I'm going the right direction here. Da -da 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 -da. That's me humming to myself. Okay, I am going to take this row here. I'm going to multiply this row times 2, and then I'm going to add it to this row. Okay? That will make that, el oops. That'll make that element there 0. Now I want to make that element 0. What am I going to do? I'm going to take this row, multiply times minus 3.5, and add it to that row. Okay. Because I'm using this row because I have zeros here, so it's not going to screw up these entries, or it won't screw up these ones either. And if you do this, it's a lot of fun, you get this tiny matrix over here. Okay? And you can see with this tiny matrix, I'm almost there. Right? And I've got this. Now I need to get rid of that there. Okay? And to get rid of that, all I have to do is add this row to this row, and that will make that element equal to zero. Right? And if I do that, you end up with the final result. Okay? So this is yay. This one you go yay. Okay. Yay. <laughs> That's usually more enthusiasm. I'm happy with, you know, 2% of the crowd. All right. So there's the matrix A. I mean, sorry, there's the identity matrix. That's by definition, I found the inverse. It's the last three columns of the matrix. It's this thing right here. Okay? And um, I think I got a little overzealous. And I proved it on the next slide. But you, so you get the idea. The first thing is do exactly what we've done before in terms of doing Gaussian el elimination. And that's make this a triangular matrix. That's step one. Step two is then make all the diagonal elements equal one. And then the, next, the last step is to make all the elements above that diagonal equal to zero. And if you do, you now have your identity. Okay. So you can see that, yeah. Does this work for more than three by three? Yeah works for any, but it just becomes labor intensive, right? You get to do it. It's, it's a lot more work, the bigger the matrix is. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a method that works for a problem of any size, but the amount of work required grows quickly with the, with the, with the size. So, you know, in a class like this, you know, I'll routinely ask you to find the inverse of a two by two matrix. Anyone can do that because there's a formula. And you know, I might ask you three by three, but I'm not going to ask you more than that. Because if you can find the inverse of a 3 by 3 matrix, it's pretty clear you can do a bigger one. It's just you don't want to, right? It doesn't prove anything. It just proves you can do mindless algebra. So sometimes you have to do a little bit of mindless algebra because it is engineering, right? But um, I, don't want to, I don't want to waste your time you know, um, doing a lot of hand calculations on large matrices. Okay, so there's the inverse. And so I think for whatever reason I got crazed... Probably too much caffeine is my guess. So I took, I wanted to prove to myself this was the identity matrix. Because I think if you look at the inverse matrix and you look at the A matrix, it's not clear that if you multiply them, you'll get the identity matrix back. Unless you're like really smart and you can just see that, okay? So all I'm doing here is kind of proving it. So I'm forming a matrix C by multiplying A or A inverse. I could also do A inverse times A. It won't make any difference. So I put my A matrix there, I put this A inverse I just found, and now I'm going to start multiplying them. And all I do is the first row to convince you that this is starting to work out. So to find the first element of the C matrix, which I hope is going to be the identity matrix, it will be if I didn't make a mistake, is I'm going to multiply the first row times the first column. And that's what you see called C11, right? To find the 1, 1 element of the matrix C, you multiply the first row of A times the first co column of A inverse. And if you perform that calculation, which I won't go through the details, you get 1. Good. That's what you want. If you do the next elements, so you want the 1, 2 element, that's first row, second column. And then C1, 3 is first row, third column. They're both 0. Okay. So what I've established by doing that, and then I, then I apparently ran out of coffee, right? Or ran out of slide. 
is I just found that that was one, that zero, and that zero. If you do the same thing for the next three rows, you'll find you get the identity back. It works. It's guaranteed to work unless you make a mistake. Okay. Now, if I were you guys and I was asked to do a calculation like this, you might ask, how do I do this without making a mistake? First thing I do is take the matrix A, go into MATLAB, find the A inverse. Okay. <laughs> then I do all the hand calculations, and then what happens? I get to the end and it's not the right answer. Right? The only way I know is the right answer is because I have it with, with my MATLAB. Okay? So then, okay, then I, then I make sure it's correct. Right? This is, this is r the chances of making an error here are not small. Look at all these tedious calculations. Okay? So I must admit, when I do an example like this, I find the inverse first using MATLAB and then make sure when I'm all done I got what I expect. Okay? Will that option be available on the test? No, that, that will not. Okay. All right. So now, um, Let's see how many we've, geez. I thought to myself, what is the optimal length of a class? And I used to be hardcore and I'd be like, you know, one of those professors is like 216. I'm like, just wait a minute, right? And you guys would be trying to gather your books and run away. So I said, okay, obviously I'm a bit overzealous. I'm going to make less slides and make them less dense. It used to be like sometimes these slides would have the amount of one slide on, two or three slides on one single slide. So people would just be like, and I'd be like, wait, I know you don't understand, but let's make sure we finish it all. Okay, so, um, so now I've obviously gone to the other extreme. So I decided the optimal time to quit is probably about between 2.05 and 2.10, right? Because then occasionally I get like a student come up and everyone seems really relaxed, right? But I think this is too relaxing. That's, that's what I'm saying. So in the future, you're gonna, I have more slides coming. But for now, we'll, we'll do this. Okay, so great. So now we know what the inverse means. Right? If you multiply A, you get the identity matrix back. We've learned how to calculate the inverse. If it's two by two, you use the explicit formula. Otherwise, you do this Gauss-Jordan elimination. Very painful. Um, but yet, I haven't, still, I haven't given you any idea why it's useful. Right? Like, is there some reason I want to multiply A and get the identity matrix back? No. You never want to do that. Okay? But what you want to do is solve sets of linear algebraic equations. So, and it goes a little something like this. Is that, um, if I had chalk, you have a set of equations that look like AX equal B, right? And the whole reason I really introduced the inverse is because I propose I can solve equations by doing this. So I'm going to multiply on that left-hand side of this equation times A inverse, right? I'm allowed to multiply on both sides of any equation things that are not zero, right? So as long as A inverse exists, it's not singular. Well, as long as A inverse exists, I can multiply on the left of both sides of the equation. I can multiply on the right, too, if I want. It's not useful, but I can do it. Okay? Okay, so I get this. Looks good. Okay, this thing here, we know A inverse times A, by definition, is the identity matrix, right? So now we get the identity matrix times X equal A inverse times B. And my claim is, and I hope that you can see this is true, the identity matrix times x just gives you x back. Right? So I mean, let's say at this identity matrix, just as an example, this applies to any dimension. Here's your vector x. You multiply these two, th these two things to get a new vector, which is their product, right? So this row times that column picks off x1. This row times that column picks off x2. Last thing gives you back x. So, you know, it's just x back. Okay? All right. So this says, hey, amazingly, I found a way to solve linear algebraic equations. All I have to do is compute the inverse. That's the fly in the ointment, right? Because that's not all that much fun. It's not, it, it takes some work to do. So what I'm going to do here at the end is just go through this simple example here. Very simple, okay? So there, it's a two by two system. So there's my matrix A and there's my vector B. Um, first of all, if you look at the, you would like to know the matrix is non-singular before you begin this exercise. If, you, if it is singular, you'll find out soon enough because the determinant would be zero. But you can kind of see for a two by two problem, right? If I multiply this row times a constant, there's no way to get this row, so should be okay. All right, so this is, this is the formula, okay, right? This is the formula I gave you, sorry, just so you don't think this is new. That's this formula at the top right here, okay? I'm just applying that formula. Oops. 
Okay, so if I want to find the, the inverse, right, because I'm going to use this solution here, and so to do this I need to find the inverse, so the first step is to find it, and it is equal to 1 over the determinant of a, which I need to compute, and then according to the formula I switch the two diagonal elements, make that one 5 and that's 1, and then I negate the two off diagonal elements, minus 2 and 3. Okay, just applying the formula. Okay, good. <coughs> now I have to find the determinant, though, of this matrix A. You'll recall the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix is that times that. Two diagonal elements multiplied together. Subtract the two off diagonal elements. So it's 5 minus 6. That gives you a minus 1 right there. Then you can just multiply this matrix by the scalar, which is minus 1, and you get this matrix here. Just negate every element of A. And now you can compute this solution. There's the inverse matrix that we just computed. There's the um, vector B. Multiply them together. So what do you get? Minus 5 plus 4. That gives you a minus 1. And then you get um, 3 minus 2, which in my book is 1. Okay? So you found the solution. Now, is that, is that a more efficient way to find a solution? than the Gauss-Jordan elimination? Not necessarily. I mean the Gauss elimination, right? The Gauss elimination was find a triangular system and then back substitute. So the reason, so this provides one way to solve linear algebraic equations. Um, but the, the inverse itself is a very important concept in linear algebra. And so what we're going to talk about, I don't know if it's next time or soon, is like when do we anticipate having trouble solving these kind of problems? In other words, um, remember I talked about this whole idea of maybe A has almost linearly dependent columns or rows. So that will be reflected in a property of, of A called the condition number, which has something to do with how easily you can compute this A inverse. And then, I don't know if it's next week, but I think it might be, I'm going to extend this treatment to things that look like this. Okay. So, now I'm going to say A, if, if I remember my notation right, is M by N matrix, not square anymore. Okay. I have M equations and N unknowns. So, at this point, we know everything... There's nothing, not much more to know about that case, right? That's where it's square. That's what we did the last lecture or two. Um, the only thing we're going to talk more about that is if this A is a so-called ill-conditioned matrix and what might happen, okay? And I'll t teach you how to do it in MATLAB. So we're going to also consider the case where if you, you have more, let me see, more equations than unknowns, okay? You might say more equations than unknowns. As you might imagine, if you have more equations than unknowns, you can't satisfy all the equations, right? So then we do something called least squares. Have you heard the term least squares or sum of least squares? So then what we're going to do is minimize, I'll show you, in order to generate a solution to this equation, which has no exact solution because there's no way to satisfy three equations with two values of x, generally speaking, okay? Um, we will um, solve this set of equations or I should say this set of equations, if there's more unknowns than equations or more equations than unknowns using least squares techniques, okay? So that should be all you need to know to do the homework problems. should be pretty easy. You are free, and you're free to approach the table if you want to discuss anything with me. That's